introduce our speakers and to get the presentations rolling. Thank you for coming. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lena. Uh, I am Garrett's new sidekick and your new vice president. Uh, so I, I'll introduce the second group in the second half of the programming uh, right before they present. But I'm going to start off with our headliner, Dr. Matthew Sturm. He is the professor of geophysics and the leader in the snow ice permafrost group at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. He is also the author of this uh, wonderful book, Field Guide to Snow, uh, which talks about crystal shapes, how they uh, move, how they change over time, and how they stick to each other. I believe these are for sale today in the back if you want one of these books. Uh, his presentation is going to be called The 30,000 Kilometer Mountain Snow Travels and Studies in Arctic Alaska. I'm going to give you a little bit of biographical information about Dr. Matthew Sturm so you understand where he's coming from. So Matthew Sturm came to the Arctic in 1973 aboard the U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker Northwind. This was his first experience with sea ice and tundra. After completing an undergraduate degree in geology at New Mexico Tech, he returned to Alaska in 1981 to study glaciers for his uh, master's and uh, later for his PhD in snow metamorphism. So he, um, Dr. Matthew Sturm has been studying science, um, snow science since uh, 1981 here in Alaska. Since that time, he has split his time between studying snow on tundra and on sea ice. He was employed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, cold region. Recording in progress. Oh, no. <laughs> he was employed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, cold regions research and engineering laboratory between 87 and 2012. Um, and since then, he's returned to the University of Alaska at Fairbanks as the professor of geophysics and the leader of the snow ice permafrost group. Uh, Dr. Sturm has been a mountain climber since the age of 16. He has led over 35 long expeditions in the Arctic and in the Ar Antarctic and I think Greenland as well, often staying out for months. He's the author of four books, over 150 technical papers on snow, and holds patents for several specialized tools for measuring snow. His newest book, Field Guide to Snow, explains how snow works in simple terms for the public. Uh, so I just want to point out that Matthew came here just to speak with us from Fairbanks. He flew here this morning. So can you guys please give him the loudest round of applause that you can? <laughs> Well, um, good evening. It's, it's nice that it's snowing. If you study snow for a living, that's a good thing. But it, it can chill an audience, so I'm, I'm delighted to actually have an audience here. I thought it might be a little sparse. Um, I'm also really nice to be here. My son now lives in Anchorage. He's in the audience. And a very good friend of mine who works for me often in the Arctic is here, so there's a few friendly faces. Um, when Lena asked me to speak, it was kind of as a snow scientist, and I, I was like, wait a minute, I, I didn't, I'm a climber, or was a climber. I'm old enough that maybe that's past tense. I'm not sure. I still do some climbing, um, but I was very active as a climber once, so I thought, I, I kind of want to talk about this in a broader sense. And it ended up a bit of a personal sort of journey to make this thing. This, this slideshow. What struck me and, and the title was that at some point in my life the big climbing expeditions gave way to big science expeditions, hence the term, and they were a lot flatter than mountains, but they had a lot in common and that's kind of what I want to lead you through tonight, of the commonality between actually what I do for a living and what I did for fun, okay? And um, you just heard about my qualifications. I won't 
go very far into that. I, maybe, maybe the Coast Guard's the best. Anyway, um, I've been doing snow for a long time. If you're going to listen to someone up at the front of a room, and you might ask questions, you, you should ask yourself, does, does this person know what they're talking about? So the really, the answer to that is, well, hopefully, because I've been doing snow research for 40 years. Um, but there are people who've been doing it longer. This is my mentor. His name is Carl Benson. He's 95, and I had uh, lunch with him last week with Charlie Parr. And um, he's still very much with it. And he's the reason I came to Alaska. And probably the reason I ended up doing very long traverses. That's a picture of Greenland. And Carl did these epic traverses down the spine of Greenland to understand how Greenland worked. That work was done in the 1950s. And today it is seminal research for us understanding how much sea level will rise due to the um, melting of the Greenland ice cap. Impressive work, impressive man. It was my great fortune to be his grad student. Am I making it harder for you? I like to move around. And the irony of all this is my thesis, which I did under him. What you can see behind me there looks like a beautiful pool table made out of sand, and there's 210 tiny little bead thermistors to measure the three-dimensional temperature in the snow that was going to fall around it. What you can see is to the back of me is Geist Road in Fairbanks, which is kind of like Odap Dow Road. And on the other side is Koyakuk Drive. This was anything but a big adventure. And for four years, for about 100 days a year, that's where I was. So maybe it was frustration at not doing adventures. So this was a fabulously, intellectually fabulous project that eventually, after my thesis work, I began to do work at a much, much larger scale. Okay. Um, and what we were looking for was whether air moved through the snow. And the answer is yes. Um, but if you, I, I grew up on a steady diet of the classic climbing books. For the older people here, you probably recognize those. If you're young and you don't know what those titles and you haven't read them, you should. These are the absolute classic literature on climbing. And the interesting thing is there's another genre of literature that's virtually the same. It's the classic literature on polar exploration. I, I devoured both of those. I had, up until recently, an entire set of Mountain Magazine. You remember Mountain Magazine? I gave it to a young climber. Um, and, you know, that's all about adventure. The two genres are the same, right? It's cold, it's dark, there's fatalities, there's frostbite. It's great adventure. Um, so it's not surprising that like somewhere in my scientific work I thought, oh, I wonder if there's room for that. I, I, had to, I had to find these slides. For those of you who are old enough, you know, you're on a cell phone, these are 35 millimeter slides from back when I was doing a lot of climbing. Uh, that's me over there. For those who maybe know some of the older climbers in Alaska, it's Phil Marshall in the center. Um, I don't remember which peak he's on. For those, that's Bob Jacobs in the lower corner. He founded St. Elias Alpine Guys, which is still going today. So there was a period in my life when I was very, very active climbing. Um, and it's kind of fun to find these slides. And you have to scan them. I mean, it's bizarre. Like. But life takes a lot of turns, right? I started climbing, I think, either at 15 or 16, going to Albert Bound in Colorado. Um, for reasons of just looking for adventure, then I enlisted. That's the two sailors. I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the right as you look at it. I was on that icebreaker. And that got me into the polar regions, started getting me interested in science. Um, went to New Mexico Tech with my wife. Um, for a degree in geology, and then came up here, and my first project um, doesn't get climbed a lot, but that's Mount Wrangell. It's one of our bigger mountains in Alaska, but it's huge shield volcanoes, eight times the volume of Mount Rainier. 
It's over by Glen Allen. You see it when you drive there. So I was working on that, and I got married and had kids. That's my daughter, Sky, and my wife, who's here, but she wasn't feeling well, so she couldn't come tonight. If you're doing big mountain expeditions, fly in weeks at a time, and then you begin to do science, that's big expedition. At some point, something's got to give. You can't come home and tell your wife, well, I've just been two months in the Antarctic, but I think I'll go climbing for another month. You can, but that'll end badly. <laughs> so my world went from this to this. And the strange thing is, there's an incredible power in both of those environments. And this one, this one has gripped me ever since. For 40 years now, this environment is just as challenging, just as interesting to me as those big mountains, which are so beautiful. So let's take a look at that environment. If you look at the Arctic, the North, um, they're really well, there are two things that drive the snow cover. One is we have an awful lot of places where it's cold and still. That's Fairbanks. For 40, four years of my life, I live in the boreal forest. We had a windstorm recently that knocked down seven aspen in our yard, and it was probably blowing 10 miles an hour. I mean, most of the time there's no wind where my son grew up. The other world, our tundra world is it's cold and windy and that makes all the difference in the world. Those almost the same ingredients produce the two largest snow covers on earth. The boreal forest snow at the top, probably every one of you who's been here any length of time has seen that, and um, the tundra snow on the bottom. Now. For climbers, and particularly Anchorage climbers, this is the snow you spend a lot of time with, and it's called maritime snow. But the reality is that in order to get a snowpack this deep, you have to have very special circumstances. Atmospheric rivers that get pushed into um, elevation that dries it up and wrings out a lot of moisture. And that's actually quite rare. It happens in the coast range of the world, Chugach, it happens down along the Pacific coast, sometimes in the Sierras, but in terms of area coverage on Earth, that's not that frequent. It happens in Hokkaido. So let's go back to these snows and take a look at them. Um, we'll start with the tundra snow. My, my wife proof, has proofed every talk I've ever given, and when I showed her this video, I was just going to say, well, it's that everybody here would have seen this, and she said, well, maybe not everybody did. I'll show it, and I'm going to ask her a show of hands. This is blowing snow, and I want to see how many people haven't ever seen blowing snow. Let's see. Well, I may not be able to make the movie run. Okay. I may not be able to make it run. I'm having trouble figuring it out in this. So we won't do that. Who's never been in a ground blizzard? You, don't be embarrassed. Yeah, okay, so a few. Well, if I could run the movie, there'd be snow hissing around. It's usually a nasty place to be. We, we don't need to run it. Yeah. Okay. When you blow snow grains around, a strange thing happens, and I'm going to leave enough time for questions at the end, so I'm giving you a giveaway question. When we pulverize snow and then it comes to rest, it does something really magical called sintering. And hopefully someone in this audience will ask me more about that later. Okay, just sock that word away, center. Okay, hopefully you'll ask. And when that happens, oh, there we go. So now if you haven't seen this, you see it. Uh, blowing snow is pretty cool because it, it happens in four modes. Uh, stuff's rolling around. Stuff's bounding, it's called saltation. Some of it's going up. Saltation is a cascading event. So, yeah, I, I really love blowing snow. Okay, that's not what we want. Um, there should be another, there we go. And this is what it, this is what it makes. 
Um, in this picture, this is a lovely picture, you can see all sorts of what are called bed forms. Bed forms are what blowing snow when it comes to rest leaves behind. And I don't have a pointer, but um, you can see some ripple marks. Those are the little ripples. You can see the most common feature, which everybody knows is bad skiing, called sastrugi. That's the erosional form. In the background, it looks like ocean waves, and indeed, those are snow waves. And then further back are the really cool ones, the bark ants. These are horn-shaped dunes. So that's what blowing snow can make in our world. And it's pretty cool, but it's not great skiing. Let's go the other way. Let's go into the windless environment now. This is actually part of what I did my thesis on. Um, that's Charlie Parr, he's a grad student of mine and did a lot of work, and he's holding up a piece of snow that we've turned over that everybody sees it's glittery, right? Anybody know why it's glittering? That's nice. Wait, I heard somebody get it right. Facets. Facets, yeah, there's facets in that snow. If you don't know what a facet is, this will help. That's what's there. Of course, it's upside down now. Okay, that's faceted snow. We, and, and now we're gonna talk about faceted snow. I hope I get some questions to grow that, which is a, the culprit in a lot of avalanches. We need a strong gradient. We need it to be cold at the top and warm at the bottom, right? And if you ask, so if you ask me some questions when we get a question period, about facets, that's a good question to ask, okay? Um, just to show, I love, it's called depth four too. I love this stuff, um, more of the stuff. If you look hard there, you can see that's not well put together, is it? That looks kind of fragile, and indeed it is. So if I've got a lot of heavy cemented snow on top of that, I can break those bonds and get an avalanche. So if you're a mountaineer, bad stuff. If you're a scientist and you want to know how that forms, good stuff. <laughs> so my mentor did those epic trips in Greenland. I, I would say probably when I finally decide to retire, the thing I'll look back on that I've done as a scientist that's probably used most is this. At one point in my career, probably 30 years ago, we recognized that you could divide the world's seasonal snow that's the snow that comes and goes each year, into some very simple classes and that it held. These are the classes here, okay? And um, we did that work a long time ago and now it underpins an awful lot of what goes on in snow science. Um, it's pretty common sense, but um, the work seems to hold and you can see why I've worked on windy snow and still snow in the cold because the blue and the purple are the tundra snow and the boreal forest snow. Those are the two largest terrestrial ecosystems in the world and combined they make up an enormous part of our planet. So that's the snow I've focused on, even though maybe alpine snow is better to ski on and maritime snow makes glaciers. That's where most of the action is when it comes to climate change or it comes to ecosystem services. And this is what it looks like. All right, another question. Who here has dug a snow pit and looked at the layers ever? Yay, okay, that's good. Mostly everybody. So if you were to dig a snow pit and you were thinking about these classes, that's what these are. Um, on the left there, the tundra snow, those, if you don't know the symbols, the little balls, those are the hard wind slabs, the upside down bees and the others, those are the depth or. So it's a pretty easy mix. Hard slab, depth or, hard slab, depth or. Um, as we move to the boreal forest, pretty much all depth or. If we go way over there to your maritime snow, uh, this is the sad thing. It often gets rain on it or it melts and that water infuses in and the black marks are what we would call percolation. Water is percolated into the snow and refrozen. So it makes for a pretty nasty snow cover. Interestingly, when we were doing the work on here, um, a bunch of this work I did at Alieska, um, we were good at snow science, we weren't good at skiing that much, so ski patrol, particularly the ones who did the control back then, would generally take pity on us, so we would ride the lift up with all sorts of equipment 
and we when we had to go down, we loaded on an Akia, and then they would look, and they knew that it was going to be another disaster, us skiing down those slopes with the Akia, and they just happened to come by quitting time, and well, I'll take the Akia down, and we'd be like, oh, okay, but I was about to do it, and then pride was saved, and good, and yet we got down the mountain without wrecking the gear. But enough of that. Let's get to these 30,000 kilometer mountains, okay? It was about early 90s, John Holmgren and I were working together, and we had worked on this pool table sized piece of snow for years, and we wanted to take it out bigger. Satellites weren't working for us. We're going to go from Tulip Lake to Anacubic Pass. We're going to make snow measurements. We had two clapped out old tundras and a fold of sled with with metal runners. And uh, we did. We made it to Anacubic, about a I guess about a 300 mile round trip or something like that. Um, we made absolutely no measurements. It was desperate. It was an epic trip. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, so we made it there, met the mayor, came back, and absolutely nothing to show for it scientifically. But we had learned a few lessons. And so by 2002, we were able to start pulling off very large trips. So this one, and a whole series of trips have gone on since then, scientific trips called Snow Star. You can see the acronym up there. Um, this one went from Nome to Barrow, which was still called Barrow at the time, and um, now Ukiavik. And um, I'll give you a sense of what it was like to do the trip. Oh, so how many of these trips have we done? I actually kind of think I didn't get them all. Okay, and I, I'm, I think we've got one more coming. I guess until I can't crawl on and off a snowmobile, I'll probably keep doing them. So this is how we did them. Um, what you can see there is if, you're, if you do any snowmobiling or snow machining, um, we have Siglin sleds, now we build our own. Um, they're plastic sleds, action packers, a lot of gas on the sleds. Um, the one interesting thing is that covered sled. So mostly when people are traveling, snowmobile you don't have to do a lot of computing whereas we did so every night that's an office actually there's a little seat in there and a table and um, I think this one didn't have a heater but eventually we heated them because um, typically that was my job by the time we did camp at nine o'clock at night I had three or four hours of computing I had to do that was lovely to do it in. and this is how we lived so you begin to see some similarities. Our tents are a little bigger, but it's still a tent. Um, we have a stove, just like you have climbing. We have snowshoes. Pretty much, it maps pretty well to the world of climbing. Except on a, on a day when you're climbing, you're moving. On a day when we're on one of these traverses, we're digging snow pits up there. We're measuring snow depth with various gadgets. We're looking at the crystals of snow. We're coring the snow to get the water equivalent, and so on. So, typical day on one of these long traverses, wake up, eat breakfast, make measurements, move, make measurements, move, camp, wake up, make measurements. And you just do that day after day, very much like climbing. I mean, with occasional things in climbing of utter terror, occasionally not so much terror in this, but certainly you know, incidents would get in there. Occasionally terror when we were traveling on rivers and we hit bad ice. And like climbing long traverses start in a very warm room with way too ambitious ideas because it's warm and you're dry and what could go wrong. So you do that, you plan it, you look at the maps, Pick your route. Today you use Cal Topo, maybe um, Google Earth, but still the same. We did a lot of outreach. We still do when we're on these trips. Um, that's a little different. You buy food, tons of food that looks a lot like mountain climbing food. And this is one of our camps. There's a blizzard. I'm out in the blizzard. Actually, that wonderful office tent had, had ripped a huge hole in it, and I'm sewing it. A lot of spindrift, 
We had to hole up here for several days. That should be familiar to anybody doing Alaskan climbing. And um, at that point, you know, the biggest danger is boredom, of course, and what you brought to read. This was the longest trip. I'm not going to talk about this one. Um, I couldn't find too many, but I have a few copies of this book. This is actually a history book I wrote after it. That trip was really interesting. We were funded to do a lot of outreach. We had to go through villages all across Alaska and Yukon and Northwest Territories and Nunavut. That turns out to be all the historic places. And so this is a wonderful book if you really want to pick up some of the history of the North very quickly. Okay. I, I didn't have very many copies, but I have a few with me for those who are interested. Um, but I want to do one more travel log and then open it up for questions. This is a, a trip we did that I, I don't know that I've ever talked about before. So in 2010, we were doing our typical snow um, star related stuff. But we had an opportunity to repeat the 1924 USGS expedition and, which is rare, be in the mountains as well. It was probably the last of the epic USGS trips, and for a reason. And what the USGS geologists needed to do was get on the north slope early enough in the season to be there and do the geology once it was snow free. They had tried to come in out of Barrow from the north, that hadn't worked. They had tried to leave in the spring and they couldn't work. So they decided the way to do it was much up through the Brooks Range, put themselves on a river, wait for it to break up, go down with the canoes. The reason it's the last of the epics is this. Airplanes, how many people here have flown into a climb? Yeah, okay. Now that speeds you up a bit, doesn't it? Just a little bit. That was changing how we were, how the North was going to be dealt with. And it was changing right about 1924. So there weren't ever going to be any more epics like that. Not in my lifetime, not in anyone's. It was led by these two men, um, J.B. Murdy and Philip Smith. For those who do climb, a large portion of the Brooks Range is actually named the Philip Smith Mountains. That's named after Smith here. Um, it's always like that he wore glasses, I wear glasses. He had a terrible time with glasses fogging in the winter, and this was a long winter trip. And this is where it went. I actually forgot to put some dots. Our trip didn't end there in Barrow because there's no way to get the snowmobiles and gear out. So we snowmobiled over to Prudhoe to finish it. And we'll just do a travel log. Some of these are from the 1924 era, and some are not. Uh, this is the Murdy Group in 1924 on the Alakakit Mail Trail. Same place during our trip. Trails aren't maintained quite as well. We're making our measurements. This is Charlie Campbell from Tanana. He's ran a guiding business with dog mushing out there for years. We we're fortunate. We traveled with him. We knew where the, he knew where the trails were. Alakakit and Alatna are twin towns across the river there. We did our normal outreach. This is the Murdy expedition. This is us in about the same place. Murdy shooting dinner with us cooking our own. Um, you know, I don't think of these trips as dangerous, but the rivers are always an issue. Um, on this particular trip, the reason those uh, photos are blurry is we managed to mire all four snowmobiles in a slush swamp. Um, someone had to wait around in water this deep. I got the call. So those are my feet. Um, and it was quite cold. Uh, and then we had to stretch ropes out. So we use ropes just like climbing. And we got the stuff out. This is Murdy's group having a little better traveling. That's a hard, that's a nice blister for no one who's ever seen it. Pretty, pretty good traveling, you're not gonna fall through there. That's us on a similar feature. I have to own up when I was putting this together. 
we had ice axes in the bottom of our sleds, but we were out for more than a month. By the, these are the Aragach. I bet some people here have climbed there. And we had aspirations that we would go up into the Aragach. But by then we're a month out, and you know that your sense of the possible in a warm room is so different than your sense of the possible when you're that far out. So we got a good look at them, and we didn't get up into them. Murdy and crew turned up Yanaxarak Creek, which is where this is shown, as did we. There they Aragach in the background. Then they got on the north slope and they began to do their geology. We got to the north slope. And a very rare thing for the 30,000 kilometer mountain was we actually found ourselves in the mountains. This is Survey Pass, highest point where you can cross over that part of the Brooks Range. They got down to the Killick. I love that part of the story. They had to fix one of the canoes and then break up never came. They were there. They had to sit on that bank, I think, for eight weeks almost, waiting for the killer to break up before they could put those canoes, you can see in there, into the water and begin to do their geology. It was truly an amazing trip. We dog laid Dodoranic Tuvik for some science work and outreach and then headed for the North Slope in turned out to be very marginal weather, and we ended our trip here. This is called the Notch. So in closing, I wanted to, I think we're doing okay for time, I wanted to save time for questions. Yeah, I've, I've had this great privilege of being able to sort of work on flat mountains. They're cold, they're dark, um, but they're just intriguing. It's been a rare privilege. I still fancy myself occasionally getting out climbing, but as long as I can do that, I'll be pretty happy. And there's as much there to look at as there is sometimes in the very tall country. Um, I brought some of the books with me. Uh, the front one's a kid's book I did some time ago. Ipun in uh, Inupiat is uh, snow cover. So I guess at some break here, we'll try and sell them. A caveat, a friend lent me a square reader. I've never done this before, so it could be pretty cumbersome, but we'll see. Um, but I brought some of the books, mainly um, the one that's probably most interest to you is The Field Guide to Snow. I tried to take 40 years of my experience and put it in a form that was really easy to get. It's not a science book, it's really for people like you. And with that, I think, um, I've queued up some other slides, but what I was hoping, my son had said, well, these are going to be people who know a lot about snow. So I was sort of hoping that with the rest of this talk, I got a few more minutes, I could get some questions. So, um, and I might have a slide or two, if, depending on the question, I might be able to zoom to a slide that has something to do with it as a graphic aid. But um, I think I'm going to stop there, talking about kind of what I've done, and open the floor for any questions you have either about climbing or snow. Climbing, I might not have that many answers, but snow, I might do better. So. First question, the facet, that's, what caused that? That's compression? The facets? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question because it's like a real opener. Um, uh, one of the scientists that was one of my mentors used to do this. He'd sit there and he'd think for a second so you can get a good answer. So let me just think. Okay, when snow falls out of the sky, like's happening tonight, whoever, who noticed what's actually falling out of the sky right now? Anybody? Philip? Did you see? No, they're needles. Very, very small needles. I didn't have a magnifying glass. So what's coming out of the sky are sub-millimeter sized needles, and they'll land. I, I'm going to pretend I'm in Fairbanks, because what's probably going to happen here is they're going to melt soon, right? Is that about right for Anchorage or to get rained on? But if they didn't get rained on, they have a very high vapor pressure. So does gasoline. So if you want to understand what falls out of the sky and then what happens, you have to think about it like you just spilled some alcohol or gasoline. 
what does it do? It evaporates, right? Just disappears. Water does the same, but not quite as quick. So these things that fall out of the sky are utterly unstable. They don't last. In fact, if you dig down, you can't find a stellar dendrite, right? It's not there anymore because it can't exist at the surface of the Earth. All right. So everything in the snow begins to change form. We'll call that metamorphism. It has two choices. One is, it doesn't have two choices, but there are two basic conditions. One is the top and the bottom of the snow are about the same temperature, in which case the forms get rounder and rounder. Okay, that's not the one you asked about. The other is the top of the snow is much colder than the bottom, and it begins to drive moisture upward through the snow, just like a dryer in your house is driving moisture through the vent. And it starts to rebuild crystals. And the reason they facet is they get sourced with water molecules so much faster than they need that the crystallography takes over and we form those beautiful crystals. So that's called, it has various names, it's called a kinetic growth form. It used to be called TG snow. How many older climbers here have heard of TG? So that went out of parlance because all snow has a gradient across it, so it was misleading. So now we call it kinetic growth, but it was the old TG snow. And, the, and the, those crystals build, but they don't build good connections between them. So we get very large crystals that are fairly strong in direct vertical pressure and terribly weak in shear. What lets an avalanche go? Shear forces. So that's why. So kinetic growth. So here's, here's the mantra. Um, you get kinetic forms when you have a gradient. Okay, kinetic forms are strong vertically, but very weak in shear. Therefore, they become weakness planes for avalanches. Okay? Did I lose? I hope I didn't lose anybody. And they're beautiful. Okay. And there's some wonderful history. So I did a lot with depth form in my thesis. There was a wonderful uh, Japanese scientist, Akataya, who I corresponded with. He's passed on now. And that was his, his work. So, you know, because the crystals themselves are almost as beautiful as these stellar dendrites that we see pictures of. Um, other questions? Sure. I might get the terminology wrong, but uh, I was skiing in Canada, and the guy said, follow me to the leopard skin snow, and it was way more fun. Do you know that terminology of leopard skin snow? Uh, that's not a term I've heard. Is it three-dimensional? It just looks like spots on, on the snow, uh, the different way the wind carries it. How much new snow was there? It, uh, it wasn't new snow, it was transported snow. Oh, I, I don't know the term, and without a picture, I suspect I'd be just swinging it in the dark. Um, so it had been transported snow, but it wasn't hard, was it? No, that's, yeah, that was a, a fun place to ski. And I would have avoided it thinking it was, you know, like the ripples that you find. Yeah, it, it, I just had just surmised. Newly, hold that question, we're gonna, is someone gonna ask me about centering? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to throw you off, you didn't have a free answer for that. No, because we're gonna come back to your question, I'll come right around. I is anybody gonna ask, your, ask about? What's centering? Okay, <laughs> so this, to answer that question, we need to know that. Um, how many people here have a cell phone? Okay, yeah, everybody's got a cell phone. Um, Sintering happens not just in snow. It's quite simple. If we take any material, iron, and we bring it up within a few degrees of its melting temperature, it won't melt. But the iron in any of the things here will begin to act very strange. And if we bring two pieces of red hot iron together closely, they will bond. Okay, that's sintering. What actually happens is there's a there's about five mechanisms of molecular bonding. Okay, a lot of pieces in your cell phone are made by sintering. It's quicker than actually casting. So you, you pulverize something, you put it in a mold, you bring it up close to its temperature. What's the coldest snow anybody's ever seen here? Minus 50? 50. It's 50 degrees away from its melting temperature. That's all. It's so close to its melting temperature 
that it's an extremely volatile substance. So sintering takes warm temperatures, which snow has, but time. Now, leopard spots. If the wind moves snow, but it doesn't have time to sinter, then it's lovely stuff. So I'd have to see a picture of it to know, is that newly transported snow that hasn't had time to sinter, or something else? Um, I'll leave my email, you need a picture, and then I'll get an answer. But We weren't stopping to take pictures. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what that is. It's not a term I've heard Canadian. before. Canadian, I don't know. I'll, I'll Canadian, ask. it could be a Canadian. They have toques and very hot toques, right? <laughs> yeah. Everybody, you know, with a knit cap for us, it's some Canadian tube. And you're like, what's that? How do you pick your sample spots on those long traverses so you don't? That's a your great study? question. So many, many years ago, we defined neutral spots. So in a, in a, let's take a forest first. A neutral spot wouldn't be under a conifer tree, right? Might be in a clearing. Depends what you're trying to measure. In a windy environment, you don't want to be in a scour or drift zone. So you begin to recognize these. In addition, you know, you saw a guy with a probe. I mean, we'll probe two kilometers of depths every meter or every couple of meters. And then we'll look for what's the mean or average snow depth. And that's a neutral spot, right? Yeah, you know, a scour spot makes a really easy pit, zero snow. And some of the drifts I work on in the Arctic Refuge are eight meters deep. It would take you two days to dig a trench in. So neither of those would be neutral. We want to know about both of them, but we're not going to pick that as a neutral spot for a pit to try and get an understanding of what the winter had delivered. So, and it's a bit of an art. We get tagged on it in our papers sometimes. They're like, well, how did you know? Are you biasing it? And we're trying not to bias ourselves, but there's hundreds of, you know, there's thousands of kilometers. Um, let's see, here in the front. What's the 30,000 kilometers reference to? I, you know, I was just trying to pick how far I think I've gone on a snowmobile. Okay. So I don't know. You know, I have no idea what, I, how far I've actually gone. That's not a rough, that's a rough estimate for all the trips. Okay, and what's your favorite type of snowflake? <laughs> oh, that's pretty interesting. So I, I, there's a wonderful website maintained by Ken Liebrich at Caltech. Um, I think it's called snowcrystals.com, and you can buy his books. Um, I think like everyone else, I love stellar dendrites. The symmetry of the stellar dendrite is amazing. You guys want to know why it's symmetrical? How many people actually know why snowflakes are symmetrical? Couple. Okay, you do. Yeah. yeah. So what's really interesting, so first it's got six sides, not eight. Most kindergartners learn six. They retain that information till about middle school, then they lose it, and the adults think they're eight. There are no eight sides, it's not like six, right? And the reason they're symmetrical in a cloud is they tumble as they move down. Okay? So so they're growing. They're, the molecular structure forces the growth. It grows really generally for stellar dendrite on the points. And because it's tumbling, it sees the same thing on all six points. Flips over, flips back, flips over, flips back. And that's the reason it's symmetrical. There's one other reason it's symmetrical. If you're a snowflake photographer, you call all the bad ones, <laughs> which are 99% of them. So when you go into Ken's books for natural photography or anybody else's, nobody wants to see the lame and miserable ones. So there's a natural sort of sorting that's going on. Um, yeah, stellar dendrites are magnificent. I mean, you know, I, there are many other forms. People do know stellar dendrite, that's what you're gonna cut out for Christmas. Um, but there are needles, there are prisms, there's so many other forms, diamond dust, these beautiful forms. So if you don't know those, Go we'll find uh, snowcrystals.com and take a look at what comes out of our sky. Pretty cool. Um, I, Lena should tell me when I have to stop. <laughs> quick, quick question though. You were talking about the temperature of the snow. How cold is snow? And is it, isn't it zero degrees? No, no, no. no snow, snow can get as cold as the air depending on how long it sat there. So if, if we get a snowpack this deep, and then it turns 30 below in Fairbanks and it just stays that way. 
slowly over time the snow will get colder and colder. Okay, and it'll never it'll never get minus 30 at the bottom because there's heat in the ground. But it'll get it'll get colder and colder. Um, if we put that snow on a picnic table, then it'll get 30 below. Okay, so there's nothing preventing snow from getting very cold, but there is a source of heat underneath it called ground heat. And, and actually, when we get a wet fall, all that moisture in the soil, that has to release that heat as it freezes. So there's a way to heat the bottom. Let's see if we got anybody in the back. I've been way back there with a black hat. Uh, what to you is the most striking change that you observed in your work over the course of these traverses? The most striking change. science thing? There, there isn't one thing, but for me, um, when, when I, I love snow pits. Um, when we're on those long traverses, I'm the slow poke. My son's been on one traverse, he'll answer to that. You know, I get in a snow pit, and it's like Horton hears a who. I, I shrink myself mentally down to crystal size. And when I see what nature sort of put there, it, it never, stops amazing me. So I, I guess if I were to leave you with one thing, it's snowing right now. And it's not, it's, it, it's not only doing an amazing thing by snowing out of the sky, but it's starting to stack up this most amazing white material that's incredibly dynamic, but which most people don't realize. And it's gonna start evolving and changing, and it won't stop until it's gone. And the only way to know that is to actually get very close to it. So there isn't one thing, but it's actually to get myself as close to the material as possible and look at it. Um, it, it still gets me. I, I dig snow pits at my house just for fun that don't actually end up in science because it's just like, well, look at, you know, what's happened. Because it, it's this hidden world of, or here's a who. And if you don't look, you won't ever know it. That's the quintessential part, I guess, that keeps me going. And the rest, the science is pretty cool and everything, but there usually is some hook that keeps, you know, I'll turn 70 pretty soon here, a couple months. I mean, why would you do snow for 40 years unless there's some hook there? So I think that's it. Can you talk about how a snowflake moves through the air and in the clouds? Oh. Okay, so it's in the book, um, and I'm not an atmospheric scientist, but it's, it's pretty amazing that we can get it to snow at all. Um, liquid water supercools. What that means is that without anything else affecting it, we can actually bring water down to about minus 40. Now, ever, what's the temperature water should actually freeze at, Celsius or Fahrenheit? Zero. Okay, and most of the time it does, but that's because most of the time the water is in contact with a plastic bottle, bucket, an ice tray. The water has impurities in it. But if you double or triply distill water and then you very carefully put it in a freezer, and you can go online and watch this, or in a pet bottle, it will chill to about minus 10. And then if you tink it, it'll freeze innocently which tells us that the water really doesn't want to freeze. Now let's go up in the cloud to answer this question. I have water vapor and it's not turning into precipitation particles. It doesn't want to yet. It needs something else. And there's a lot of other junk in our atmosphere. Aerosols, salts, dust, actually a lot of biological material. And without that material in the cloud, as what's called uh, condensation nuclei, nothing happens. It won't snow. So that's number one. So if we've got that, we get a tiny little particle of ice, I mean tiny microns. And that is so light, it can't fall out of the bottom of the cloud, so it still won't snow. So the second thing we have to do is grow that. Well, I, in the book I talk about it, during the Big Bang, one thing happened that when it created oxygen and hydrogen molecules, 
and, and the whole substance called water and ice, which is that the vapor pressure of the water is higher than ice. That sounds incredibly geeky, but without it, it couldn't snow. Because what it means is the moment we have a tiny ice particle that's nucleated in a cloud, all of the surrounding water vapor will grow the ice particle instead of condensing water. Now that particle can grow, and it's getting tumble dry up and down, up and down. But as it goes up to the cloud, it grows, it comes down, it's an updraft, it's still not big enough, it grows a little more. Trillions of those crystals don't make it, but finally one is heavy enough to fall out the bottom. So it's snowing right now, which means it's very moist, and it means tons of crystals aren't making it, but plenty are. It's because they're tiny nuclei up in the cloud, and um, that very tiny difference in vapor pressure is driving it. And if that doesn't sound like a miracle, then I don't know what does. So there are a couple things. Um, Libra down at Caltech, we still don't know. There's a thing, it's in a book called the Nakai Diagram. When it snows, there's a shift from the type of crystal that's very abrupt. We might get a stellar dendrite, and then the temperature and, vape and moisture supply will change just incrementally, and it'll turn to needles. Why that transition is so abrupt he's been working on for his whole life. So that's at the crystal level, okay? The second thing we don't know much about and is what are called quasi-liquid-like layers. The reason we can ice skate and ski used to be that frictional heating was doing it, right? That's not right anymore. What we know is that there is a liquid-like layer, an unorganized layer, but we don't know a lot about it. It was just visualized with instruments in the last five years. The third, and this is more my area, is snow itself is pretty simple. I could walk outside and understand a small bit of snow, but what drives most of the science questions is we've strewn that snow across an incredibly complicated landscape. It has trees and rivers and everything, and we cannot remotely sense snow from satellites very well. Um, We've just, in the last five years, achieved the ability to map from drones with LIDAR. Maybe, maybe a few more years. Um, Philip, who works with me, we're, that's a tool that I just dreamed about 10 years ago when we were there. But mapping at very large scales remains out of the question. We can't do it yet. Okay, and until we can do that, we don't even know at peak how much snow is on Earth. We, we can't even make a stab at an estimate of how much of the world's water is just tied up in snow, like in winter. Um, so that, and so there's gonna be a big campaign this winter in Alaska related to that. So those are the big questions that sort of are driving us. There are lots of little ones, there's lots of environmental ecosystem questions too. Here in Alaska, virtually every animal we can think of and every plant in some ways, key to snow, of course, has to be. And so there's tons of stuff we don't understand about that. Should I, I you know, I don't, I don't want to go over, but it's up to you guys what you want to do next. Did, what, do we have any pressing questions? But you, you did the huts. It seems like you get a question. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> as kids in science class, we were always told there are no two snowflakes that are alike in the world. It's like, huh? How could that be? It, well, Can you talk about that? yeah, it's a philosophical question. Um, at the molecular level, that would be absolutely true. Um, I worked out, but I can't remember. I have a bad head for numbers, strangely enough. But let's say, you know, how many um, water molecules are in a snowflake? It's 10 to the 25th, right? Okay. And there are lattice imperfections. If you, if you look at scanning electron microscopy and stuff, you know, any surface or thing we would look at had all these tiny little pits and lattice imperfections. At that level, no, no two will ever be alike. However, but I don't like that answer. Um, Walt 
Teague was one of my professors. His son was one of my grad students. And Walt studied diamond dust. Do you know what diamond dust is? Okay. On a very cold, clear day, you go out and it's sunny and you look up and the sky is glittering. Okay, that's diamond dust. Those are extremely simple crystals. They look like cut glass. Many of them are very similar to the point where I would answer the question, yes, we can see two crystals that would be, to a human, visually impossible to separate. As they get more and more innate, it gets less probable. But um, So the answer is, the, the molecular answer is no, no two are alike. But I think the more human answer is, yeah, we probably see repeats sometimes. You know, the simpler the crystal, the more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And what? We'll do one more question. What have you hoped to learn from digging snow pits, and has your data changed over the decades? So the first part of that is, snow's a three-dimensional field, right? So that, when, we, when, we, when we first began to see satellite products of the Earth, it was, it was unbelievably um, eye-opening because you could look at the Atacama Desert and the white sands and it, well, that looks different. But that's a skin function. You're just seeing the surface. The way snow impacts our world is it's not a surface, it's a thickness, right? Here in the Chugach, it's going to be uh, four meters thick. In Fairbanks, it might be this thick. And the properties that then determine how good an insulation is, how much water it has, um, how animals will move through it. This is all about looking in a third dimension. And um, it turns out, except for some great uh, radar techniques, we, we still only have one way, cut a pit open and look. So it, it, you know, be, in, in the same way that a soil scientist still cuts a pit in the soil to see what's there. So we have to do that. Um, so that's the first part. And so it, it grounds me, it, it keeps me real, and it ties what I can see from a satellite or an airplane to the actual physical and material properties of the snow. Of the stuff I worked on, you know, I, some of it's pretty prosaic. I spent a decade, or more than a decade of my life, using various instruments to measure, measure the R value of snow, right? Why do we need to know that? Well, we're thawing permafrost all across Alaska, but that process is hugely moderated by how much snow we get, and it's our value. So if someone has to sit there in a lab and measure our values of snow, it turns out a little harder to do than insulation. So work like that, I felt like, has helped quite a bit. Um, I have a couple other papers that are just pure um, one of the newer papers that I did with a wonderful grad student who's now a doctor um, was called How Do Snow Smooth Landscapes? How many of you have noticed that the world gets smoother and more relaxing when it's snow covered? Yeah, how does it do that? Well, we actually wrote a paper on that. I don't think, I don't know if that helped the world at all. It was a very cool paper. Um, and it does it through a lot of different things, you know, like bouncing and stuff. but. Here was something the world has noticed for years and we wanted to understand how. And so there's practical stuff and there's more esoteric stuff. I should stop there and turn it over.